Um, so it is my great pleasure to to now introduce um, Karen and uh, Gilliland, who is the Chief Executive of the New Zealand College of Midwives, with 50 years midwifery and nursing experience, including teaching, research, governance and management. She's represented midwifery on numerous fora, such as the Nursing Council, Pharmac Board, uh, was a Canterbury um, District Health Board member for six years, and a member of the International Confederation of Midwives, ICM Board, for 20 years. Karen also chaired the ICM Scientific Planning and Programming Committee, and currently co-chairs the ICM Regulation Standing Committee. Karen co-authored the Midwifery Partnership, A Model for Practice, and Women's Business, the history of the New Zealand College of Midwives, and is the author of numerous published papers, articles, and books. Karen was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit uh, for Services to New Zealand in Midwifery and Women's Health in 2000. She lead, leads the High Court action on pay equity on behalf of the New Zealand College of Midwives. Welcome, Karen. <coughs> Sorry. Th thank you, Jean, for that. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, thanks very much for running through the, the history as well. I can remember the first time I, I did something and it sort of terrified me because I'm not particularly um, IT literate. <laughs> so to see the progress is pretty amazing and for me to be sitting here and able to use it is even more amazing. <laughs> um, hello and good morning everybody from New Zealand. Kia ora, tatu, kia ora. Um, it's, today I was really really reflecting on the last couple of years we've had in New Zealand where uh, the power of women's voices um, have actually made sure that midwives voices have been heard and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, oh how do I get, oh here we go, yes, oh it's magic. <laughs> um, despite actually being an age old profession uh, we still face major prejudice and predetermined bias, and, and this bias is, as, as you all know, is a gendered one, and it's, it's not only directed at us, it's directed in women and, and, and children. And even the fact that our name is always associated with women, wise woman, earth mother, mother of light, um, means that we can't bypass um, how the world sees midwifery. But we also can't bypass how midwives actually, you know, the part that we pay in, in, in giving women a voice, voice and choice as well. Um, the relationships that we have um, with women and families is actually the key to progress and good relationships and public support rely on good midwifery. So everything is a catch-22 if we don't practice midwifery in a way that women want, then women don't want us. But advocacy and support is a daily feature of midwifery life still. And many New Zealand um, midwives have gone further to, to take part in, in political roles and governance roles. We have midwives who are mayors of cities. We have midwives who are MPs. We have midwives on hospital boards. All, all these things that um, midwives want to actually take part in a humane society and, and, and make a contribution to the way in which women and midwives are seen in society. And so, what, you know, when I talk to midwives about, you know, what, what makes us so political and so proud, and most of them talk about what it is to actually be a midwife, that actually being a midwife is very endearing. And the sort of things that, that they talk about, I've just, you know, put down here and all of you will be aware of them, but at the top, I think is the relationship one and here in New Zealand the partnership model is what um, is what dictates how we practice but I mean before you know underlying all that is the fact that midwives you know they have autonomy to be a midwife to be a, a proud and uh, woman to you know make sure that the the way in which we work with women helps women to also be proud and and confident um, the partnership the partnership model here is in New Zealand, um, you know, what we say is that it's mutually empowering, that, that it's, there's as much in it for midwives as there is for women. Um, and, and the 
underlying principles of that, of course, are about, you know, the way in which the midwife and the woman negotiate what it is they want, that they both feel that they're on equal grounds to say what they want when they want. They share the responsibility of the decisions they make, and it's all based on informed choice and consent. And that, of course, relies on, um, that relies on midwives being good at what they do and good at relationships. So when I, I talked to midwives uh, recently, because we've been, you know, very conscious in the last few years here in New Zealand that we've somehow got to educate the public more about what it is we do. And we said to them, well, what makes you a good midwife? And uh, I just thought I'd, I'd give you a couple of, of examples of what midwives say. Uh, and, they, and they think, I think that they sort of should really resonate throughout the world, wherever we are, and whatever your model of care is. And, and this midwife was talking about the rhythm of birth and the emotional roller coaster, and that she, she loves being part of that. And I, you know, I'll let you read that. Um, but the tears and laughter, the adrenaline, the peaceful calmness, I'm sure that most of us attending a woman in labor can, can, relate, to, can relate to that. Um, and then in New Zealand, where we've got a continuity of care model, that midwife and her student in this picture, uh, she knows that when she goes to visit her, that she'll actually see the impact of all those, all those hours of work that she put into that, that woman and her family. And, and the falling in love process, you know, with the baby. Um, midwives love all that. Um, the, the other thing that midwives said a lot is that she knows that her involvement with this woman has changed that woman. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully it is a positive change. But as you know, in, when working conditions and uh, resources are not there, um, that, that, um, change is difficult to achieve but you know I'm, if i love this photo from uh the solomons where where the the young teenage woman is actually confident enough to wear the t-shirt um and she her, the midwives and the in the solomons were completely able to you know talk about what the relationship was that they had with the women as well in the same way as we do it's sort of universal isn't it um, and then the other part of it is the Fano or um, family um, involvement is that whilst midwifery is women centered, it's the woman who chooses all of those around her and she sometimes chooses to be alone, but not very often, but she will choose to have a um, partner, she chooses to have a family. And, and when you're a midwife watching that, and you know that the family is, is right behind the mother. Um, you know, you sort of feel a bit privileged that you're sharing with, with her and her family. And you, you, you also enjoy the relationships that you have with the dads. And you, and you sort of feel like you've made a major contribution to the well-being of a, of a humane society. I love that quote. I, I just think that that, um, that underlines pretty much everything, you know, that we believe in. And of course, you know, we've got to be proud of, of what we do. Because if, you know, loving what you do um is sort of makes makes it easier to get up in the night <laughs> um but also the structures around us are pretty essential to sustain it so loving midwifery in a way is not really enough in today's world and you know so i thought well let's have a look at what the barriers are um what the barriers are in most countries and all of this will, won't be news to you either but you know pretty much everywhere women's work is taken for granted. And in the main, it's undervalued. I, I think New Zealand in the early 90s was the first country to be paid at the same rate as doctors who provided midwifery care, and we celebrated that a lot. We, we were aware that as soon as midwifery became the predominant provider of, of services, that it was probably unlikely we were gonna retain that amount of um, value. And that's exactly what's happened here in New Zealand. Um, so right throughout the world, I think that midwifery is constantly facing undervaluing, underpaid, and, and we read constantly all around the world about the stress that midwives are, uh, um, are under. I mean, it is really, really sad, I think, that in many countries, some women still don't even have a, a, a midwife at their labour and birth, and me, most don't have a known midwife. 
and even fewer have a midwife who actually know them and have gone through their pregnancy and will be there after the birth. But actually, if we're to do that, in New Zealand we do do that, um, we can only do it if we're well supported and equi equitably funded. You know, I mean, there has to be there has to be a value placed on midwifery, and we we've we've spent quite a long time in New Zealand trying to fight for that. We um, in the last couple of years we've um, we've tried to take on a public education campaign because even after 28 years, many of the public still really put the medical viewpoint on the pedestal above the midwifery's uh, specialty knowledge. And successive governments, we've had a, a, a reasonably neoliberal right-wing government for the last nine years. And over that nine years, um, it failed dismally to support and pay midwifery properly, which is why we've ended up in this position of having to go back to women and say, help. Um, so so our, our public campaign has, um, has taken quite a few roads. Uh, we, we had to actually protest on some occasions we've had to take to the streets. Um, in 2015, we actually went to the High Court and we lodged a complaint against the government. We sued the government for gender discrimination and we did it under the Bill of Rights. We never made it to court because the um, ministry actually came back and said, look, we will now talk and we will mediate. And for those of you who have ever been involved in any legal action, it is an extraordinarily expensive process. And the New Zealand midwives, I think, are to be congratulated in that they were prepared to take on that, that enormous um, cost to try and get a human rights um, um, principle seen and heard. I know the Canadians amongst you will feel um, this is very familiar to you and I've talked a lot to your lawyers and, your, and the midwives that took your court, court case and our lawyers talk to each other in Canada and New Zealand because actually the issues are exactly the same. Most of the lawyers that we worked for us just couldn't believe the gender nature of it. Um, it, it's when, when, you know, in your day to day to life, if you're, if you're an educated person, people find it very hard to believe how insidious gender discrimination is. And I think over the years, um, New Zealand started to, um, started to sort of try and drop that women gendered, um, narrative, uh, you know, and trying to get more family based, all those things, but actually we probably should never have done that. We should have stuck to our knitting and called it a feminist issue and a gender issue. Um, but all of you who've ever been political, you know how difficult it is to maintain that stand against such, you know, I would call oppression. Um, every time a woman stands up, she has to stand up better dressed for the better hairstyle, um, you know, much more articulate and, you know, it just gets too hard. And I think midwives in New Zealand sort of just were so relieved to get the fact that they were autonomous and they were paid well, they all got on with being a midwife. And we sort of lost a little of our political drive. But boy, have we got it back. Um, we um, started a campaign called Midwives in Crisis. And it was interesting using the word crisis was something we've never done because in 28, 25 years, we were always putting the positive on midwifery, saying that, you know, like midwifery is well educated, midwifery is a proud profession, all these sorts of things, never asking, never trying, trying not to put a chink in our armor, because in politics, if women show any, any gap that, that someone can get in and destroy you, <laughs> then uh, that, that was our experience, that's what happened. But actually, after the court case and the, the mediation taking so long, midwives just became quite despairing about change. And so we thought we need to rally the troops and we need to ask for help. So we did this thing about writing to every member of parliament in the country and saying that they need to take a cross party approach, stop, stop paying, playing party politics and actually get behind women, get behind your women, get behind your families and actually approve the budget no matter who the government is. Could you not all just get behind the midwives? And that has been very successful. The midwives um, and women, you know, they've all, every MP in the country has been, has been visited. 
Um, the other things that that um, regions of the college have done is that they they designed postcards, and thousands of postcards just let, you know postcards written to the prime minister, written to the minister of health, the minister of women. They they've gone through in the thousands. Um, some primary birthing units or you know birthing centres that. Um, have invited politicians for afternoon tea, showed them round, token them through, really um, trying to demonstrate what it is that we do. Um, lots of stories in the local media, you know, doing sort of case study type stories that people can relate to. And those, those over the last two years, uh, it, it's built up and built up. And um, what we were building towards is sort of getting women to see that the, the service they got from their midwife on an individual level was, was actually under threat. And because, you know, I mean, we always took the view that we didn't want to um, undermine women's trust in the system. But actually, in the end, in 1990, when we tr got the law changed, it was women voices that came to the front that, that the politicians listened to and some 28 years later here we are again right back at nobody listening to the profession and we needed women to be our voice again and it is it is really extraordinary how they've done that um, and, and so it's that, you know, the saying that was very popular, women need midwives, need women, need midwives. It is so true. If we are not joined together and providing care in the way women want and recognise, we can get lost. And um, I think the New Zealand midwives should be congratulated for carrying on for 28 years and the same, the same sort of support that they got 28 years ago, they got, they got today. And we've been um, we've been doing all sorts of um, protests and marching and oh, there we go um, and getting help from all sorts of people. Rural women, New Zealand. We're very influential in New Zealand, and um, you know that, that if in your country you've got groups of voting people that hold influence, those are the ones that can get to the politicians and rural women. Um, have been very supportive. We have journalists, a woman called Emily Wrights, who's been really an amazing um, advocate for women. And we've got lots of those women consumers and they organised picnics on Parliament Law last year and another one this year. We even, and I want to say thank you so much um, to the international middle free community, um, the Dear David campaign was, um, uh, sorry, the Dear David campaign was a sort of a grassroots movement with women and starting with rural women actually and rural midwives and they started writing letters to the Minister of Health who was called David um, and it, it became a most amazing grassroots movement and um, he received I don't know how many, he's not telling us, but essentially the, the catch word was Dear David and then anyone and anyone um, was able to write in. And these are just a couple of examples of um, the thousands of letters. Um, the Dunedin uh, midwives, who where the Minister of Health lives, posted them all up on, on yellow sticky, sticky notes up on the, the Minister of Health's window. Uh, it was... Um, it was certainly very um, uplifting, I, I think is fair to say, for those of you New Zealanders who are listening in. It was extremely uplifting for those of us who've been around for so long. And here, here were women, um, you know, come, coming to the fore, and as did the international community. Thank you to Mavis. Thank you to Barbara Katz Rothman, to Susan Crowd, the two, um, oh, all sorts of people that. Um, came in and, and helped us. Helen Clark also, I met with her and she worked behind the scenes, I'm sure, to try and help. Um, and it is interesting that in the end, it was all the women's movement that actually got action here in New Zealand. It was one woman, a woman called Mary Lou Harris, who was uh, working in Radio New Zealand and, and she did this big interview on the radio and, and it, just, it just took off. 
um, when, so when you when you think all is lost, um, actually it isn't. <laughs> uh, women in the end are, are what matter, and if we're still in tune with what women want, you know, we, we can actually achieve things. We're fairly hopeful that the um, the Prime Minister and the um, Minister of Health are listening. I actually spoke to the Prime Minister yesterday. She was in the Coro Club, which is where you meet when you're flying around the country all the time. And uh, she was she indicated that she was very supportive. Um, but I suppose it's still up to us in the end, isn't it? It is our profession and one that we should um, take hold of as well. And I, I think it's a bit hilarious. I, I found this Hugh Laurie, you know, he plays that house doctor, and I thought, here we are taking the advice of the doctor. I just, it was just a joke. <laughs> but I do think that, you know, it's, it, it is, everybody thinks that someone else is going to do something and you're not quite ready to do things. I think that's very true of midwives, that they're not quite ready to stand up, they're not quite ready to do. But actually in New Zealand, they all were ready and they were ready now and in unison. And um, I think, generally speaking, I agree with you, Laurie, now is a good time as any, and you just have to keep sticking to it. And I hopefully at the next um, virtual day, I hope we, um, we're we able to report back that we've had our pay increases and that we now have the resources and are paid for what we do. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Karen. Um, there's been a lot of comments, supportive comments down the side. Um, I didn't see very many questions um, except the one there about um, the um, Prime Minister. Uh, did you think that uh, having um, Jacinda Ardern in that, that position will make any difference? Um, we, we've actually tried to be to leave Jacinda Ardern out of it. I think as midwives it, it is not okay to um, call the Prime Minister on her pregnancy, that's her as a woman. And so I've said to her quite clearly, you know, you are a Prime Minister, number one, number two, and then you're a woman. Uh, so we, you know, it is it is your choice what, what you do and how you do that. And it's not our role as a profession overall to be trying to bully you into um, one way or the other. And uh, then I did say to her, but I do hope you're getting a lot of rest. <laughs> So um, <laughs> we, um, you know, I think we have to be careful that we don't make women politicians have, um, you know, don't, don't make them feel the way a lot of people make midwives feel, and that's put upon. We don't, we, we need to be really careful that our pregnant politicians are actually politicians and that their pregnancy shouldn't be hold, held over them in a way that would help us. We, we just need to provide those politicians. We, our Minister of Women is also pregnant. She's having a home birth and she stood up yesterday and said she's got a midwife who she loves and she's feeling very confident and all her family are medical people. And so, you know, that that's a huge change for her and good on her, but actually she's still the Minister of Women and, and Jacinda is still the Prime Minister and that's their number one job and hopefully the midwives that they do have are making sure that they're supporting them in that role. Are there any more questions for um, Karen? I see there's, there's a question here about how would midwives wanting to get more political it depends, oh, Sarah, that yeah. one. it depends, Sarah, what you think political is. I think political is daily life, and um, and I think gender is daily life. So for, for me, political is, is about sticking up for your gender and making sure the equity is called the inequity is called out wherever you are as a midwife. And I'm not sure that we're particularly good at that. We tend to talk amongst ourselves as opposed to talking to the person that's causing the causing the inequity. And, um, you know, that takes practice. <laughs> um, so I think that the College of Midwives here, I think we provide forums for a lot of midwives to feel, um, you know, to feel strong enough to, to make sure that if they see inequitable behaviours, um, if they think that they 
um, have an answer that they're able to stand up and, and do those things. I do think New Zealand um, midwives are very strong and brave. Um, but even being strong and brave, society is much stronger than you. So I think someone here says that private is political. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that every midwife provides a different perspective when she provides fabulous midwifery care. She can provide, she can model what shared decision making and informed consent and choice is and make that mother and her family understand the role of, of women in society and that they need, mothers need to be strong um, if society is going to stay strong. Thank you, Karen. Yes, thank, thank you very much. I didn't catch any more questions there, but certainly the comments have been very supportive and um, encouraging uh, that people have been making throughout the time you've been talking. And um, of course, in New Zealand, we owe a huge debt to Karen and her team and for midwives all over New Zealand who have kept the faith um, despite all these pressures that have been heaped upon them. So thank you very much. And I see that Jane thinks it was fantastic and uplifting. So <laughs> that's good. Right. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Karen.